and welcome to 10%. You know, there are some people whose writing has become associated with the place, and none more than our next guest, George Haymond, and his writing on arts and culture in Northern California. George, welcome. Thank you so much. Now, I have read your writings on opera, on theater, on ships, on just about everything. How, how did you become the arts critic, probably with more clips than anyone I know? Well, I started in 1977. Um, at the time, I was friends with someone named Kristen Robert Bjornfeldt, who was a member of the San Francisco Opera Chorus. And where Moby Dick now is, used to be a bar called the Corner Grocery Store. In the Castro District. In, in the Castro District, District yeah. which had a classical jukebox. And on Sunday afternoons, they would have concerts with aspiring singers and a really clunky upright piano. And Kristen was one of the people who would sing. Uh, Kristen's roommate at the time was Paul Lorch, who was editor of the Bay Area Reporter. And Paul, when he was in the leather bars, would hear the two famous topics, the two favorite topics were opera and a new invention called the Cuisinart. <laughs> and so he was trying to find somebody to write about opera, and Kristen said, well, George follows Beverly Seals wherever she goes to sing, so that's all you need to know. And I was handed a chance to do anything I wanted. Uh, and they said, well, you know, we can't pay you, so do whatever you want. Uh, so I decided to try writing for people who did not necessarily know about opera or would not follow it. And as the years went on, it got sometimes a little raunchier. For instance, I once titled a review of Porgy and Bess as Big Black and Uncut. <laughs> and that makes people pay attention to your writing. Yeah. Well, your writing has always been an interesting mixture of um, lines like that, which I will leave unrepeated, uh, wonderful attention-grabbing headlines, but clearly a real understanding of musicianship and the people behind them. I mean, you said you followed Beverly Sills pretty much everywhere she went, and that was true. I mean, how, how many times have you, did you see Beverly Sills perform? Lots of times, but I also got to interview her quite a few times. Um, what's different for me from many musicologists is that my education about opera and theater came from sitting in a darkened theater. In the same way people go to church every week, I was going into theaters three or four times a week during school. And so you get a different grasp of the operatic literature. You see Violetta die five or six times a season, so it's like going to visit an old friend and hold her hand. Um, there was a time when a friend of mine was in the Mets production of Carmen. She was singing Fresquita. And as a loyal friend, I went to a lot of performances, but. Carmen was running four hours then, and by the end of the fourth act, I was sitting there going, would you please die already? I have a chemistry exam in the morning. <laughs> now, you grew up in, in Manhattan. No, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. And you knew from an early age that you were both gay and loved opera, yes? No. Um, I knew I was gay when I started. I think the best moment was when there used to be old used magazine bookstores on 6th Avenue near 42nd Street. And you could go see magazines like Muscle Boy or um, Tomorrow's Man. And there was one time my father and I were in the same magazine store, and he was looking at Scientific American and National Geographic, and I glanced over and saw that he was far enough away, and I was reading Muscle Boy. Um, but no, I did not know much about opera at all. I had gone to one or two student matinees at the old Metropolitan where I saw a performance of Barbara Seville, which I remember mostly for paper planes sailing through the old auditorium. <laughs> but when the Met moved to Lincoln Center in 1966, by that point I had met a friend in Brooklyn College named Mark Topkin. And Mark liked opera, and I was the one who was always in charge of getting the tickets. We were a very good team. And he said, I want to go see the new Met. Go get tickets. So I ended up online, on the standing room line at the Met, and that was how I got introduced to opera, by what you could say are the equivalent of homeless people with a great passion. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you just said something interesting, showing how your writing history, and, and mine, a lot of people's, has spanned the definition of two words. You just talked about being online for the opera, which in 1966 meant something quite different than being online now. Oh, oh hugely different. I mean, that goes into my, my, my segue about your, your new writing gig. You're now writing for a lot of online publications. Uh, I know you have your own culture blog called My Cultural Landscape. But n now you're also contributing to the Huffington Post. That's correct. D did you ever think that the wife of a failed, closeted, gay Republican politician would be the editor 
of one of the most popular online magazines in the country. There's a question for you. You also left out who was also the author of an autobiography of Maria Callas. Sorry. Biography. Sorry. Biography. Yeah. I mean, what is it like writing for the Huffington Post? And it's, have it, you met Ariana? Uh, I only met her on the corner of 16th and Mission one time when she was running for co co governor, governor of California. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's, it's very nice, but if the web had existed back when I was writing for BAR, I would have had a completely different writing career mm -hmm. because so much of it is now easier to share with friends and to pass on links to something, whereas I used to have to um, pay for photocopying every week's columns and sending them out in the mail, right. which gets very expensive. Do you think that the quality of arts writing has gotten better or worse because of the online world in which we live, or it's just a completely different animal? It's a very different animal. I, you can break it down into several areas. There are the academics and musicologists who are often writing very dry stuff, which may not be very interesting. But thankfully, their stuff is now online so that when you need to research something, it's real easy to find stuff that you could never even get near before. Um, you have a lot of people who are bloggers who are basically trying to get free tickets to a lot of stuff. Um, and in many cases, they're writing very short pieces that are geared to celebrity news. And for, as an example, one time I was at the Frameline Film Festival and I ran into somebody who I th I'm pretty sure was Perez Hilton. And I said, how do you like them? What have you seen that you like so far? He said, oh, I don't care about any of these movies. I just want to interview ce celebrities so I can get more hits on my website. Mm -hmm. So. Very often you'll see very short snippets of blog entries. Uh, and then there are other people, like myself, who are really passionate about film or whatever else they're writing about and write in detail and from a very educated perspective. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of copy out there. I mean, I was doing a Google search of, mm -hmm. you know, George Hamon, and you've written about a lot of things for a, a lot of years. I mean, yeah. do you enjoy writing now more or before? I enjoy it more now because in some ways, the software makes it easier. Uh, in some ways, the software curbs certain compulsions. Um, I'm someone who does a lot of re-editing and rewriting, and I used to have to print something out each time and go to another room and read it and make corrections and go back and forth, mm -hmm. and that took a lot of time. It's faster now. But it's also an amazing creative outlet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, whether people work out or whether they play a musical instrument, Writing keeps me sane. Mm -hmm. I, I'm someone who enjoys spending time alone, and I enjoy playing with words. Mm -hmm. What was the single greatest operatic performance you ever saw? I honestly can't remember. I've seen so many. Give me, give me one of your top five. We talked about Callas. You loved Sills. I mean, who was your favorite to watch? Uh, Not necessarily the greatest voice. I performance. Probably Leonie Riesenick was one of them. I mean. Leonie didn't do a lot of recordings. She didn't uh, make a lot of telecasts, or her performances were not telecast that often. But Leonie was overly dramatic. In fact, people used to go see her perform in De Valkyrie just to hear her scream when they pulled the sword out of the tree. <laughs> and there were times, she used to lurch around the stage a lot. It was a very old-fashioned type of acting. And there were times, I remember one performance of The Flying Dutchman at the Met where people weren't sure if she was going to lurch over the, print, <laughs> the prompter's box and into the pit. Um, but she was always exciting. Mm -hmm. People say that Callas was the one of, if I, some people say, the greatest operatic actress uh, of her generation. Do you think that's true? I think what people forget is the context in which she made such a spark. Um, at that time, a lot of people were not great actors who were also opera singers. You kind of wheeled them out on stage, pointed, they sang. pointed them toward the audience, they sang, and they walked off. Um, many others were not trained as actresses. They were trained primarily as, as voice students. Um, Callas was the catalyst for what came later. And I mean, for instance, now you see many singers who not only look appropriate for the role they're playing, but are actually trained to know what they're singing, mm -hmm. to know who they're reacting to, and to pay attention to the other colleagues on stage. So in a sense, maybe without a Maria Callas, you wouldn't have had a Maria Ewing or a... You wouldn't uh, have had a lot of people. Yeah. Um, the gorgeous guy that played Billy Budd. Right. Yeah. Nathan Gunn. Nathan Gunn. But the thing is that um, opera is very much a live medium. And what I was explaining to somebody in the green room just before 
is that many people today are so used to hearing either sound that has been engineered or synthesized or amplified that they have never heard the unamplified human voice. Right. When you go into an opera house, it's very different sound. But what you also have to realize is that somebody is standing on a stage and trying to get that sound over an orchestra pit which may contain 80 to 100 musicians and also into a house that may seat 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. That's a tremendous athletic feat and most people don't know it. I mean, there are singers who have lost 10 pounds of water during a performance mm -hmm. because they're also wearing a 50 pound costume that's hot as hell inside. Mm -hmm. So many people are not aware of that. They're used to seeing opera on video where everything looks perfect. Um, that's not the case. Right. You told us your favorite operatic experience. In our last few moments, tell us your worst experience. Well, there are two. One was an Aida that was done at the Matunic Theater by the Sea in Rhode Island on an op art set for the boys in the band <laughs> without a triumphal scene. But Amanazro did hide behind a potted plant in Michael's bedroom. Um, the second one was in London. There was a performance of Aida again with without a triumphal scene but all the costumes were made out of CDs <laughs> and so they shone very well but it sounded horrible <laughs> we only have a few moments left that we didn't get to your Martin Bernheimer story but I'll have you back real quick in 10 seconds tell what you tell us what you're looking forward to seeing this fall in San Francisco well a couple of things uh, part two of the salt plays at shotgun players mm -hmm. uh, that's coming up in the beginning of December uh, Central Works Theatre Ensemble in Berkeley is doing Penelope's Odyssey. Uh, and there are ongoing film festivals almost every week. And we'll have George Tack talk about it. Next, we're going to learn about how to be gay and Asian in the South Bay, SBQA. I'm David Perry. We'll be right back.